Hey guys, my name's Phil Boileau. Joined by my partner Justin Rowan. This is a fill in the trade episode. We're talking about the Toronto Raptors. The Raptors on a bit of a slide of late, not doing as well as they did with their red hot start, and we're looking into why that may be happening. And you know, we're gonna have some fun. What can we do? Maybe play a little pocket GM. What can we do about this? Uh, now, Justin, um, I know. Uh, you've been covering the Cavs for a while, but obviously, being a fellow Canadian, the Raptors get a lot of attention here. What do you think tipped that balance between them being red hot, on fire, you know, a top three team in the league, and now slowly slipping down those power rankings? Well, I think what you saw at the start of the year, a big part of that, A, they had continuity. Coming in from last season, uh, you looked at a lot of teams that had complete roster overhauls in the summer. So that was going to take a lot of time for those teams to figure it out, to de develop chemistry, which was something Toronto had in abundance. Um, the chemistry that Toronto had was also combined with a very, very easy schedule at the start of the year. It was a top seven or bottom seven in strength of schedule for the bulk of that. And a lot of the top tier teams that they played in that stretch, as rare as that was, were facing major injury concerns. You look at the Memphis Grizzlies, who they beat, I believe, in overtime. Uh, they were missing two starters, Tony Allen and uh, Courtney Lee, as well as four key contributors off the bench. So that was a narrow, narrow victory over a team that was in shambles, basically. And the guys that were playing had the flu. So you And the other tough teams they beat, I mean, they beat Atlanta at the start of the year. Atlanta ha didn't have continuity. So it was a lot of factors like that. And then as the schedule gets tougher, DeRozan goes down, um, other teams get more in a rhythm, so I think that's why you start to see them slide. Absolutely. I think continuity. I mean, when you look at their off-season signings, that was their major key, right? Trying to keep the guys they had, the guys that pushed them towards success at the end of the last year. And, and of course, it always catches up to you at the end when other teams having more practice time together. We're seeing this in droves with teams that have brought a lot of new faces, such as uh, Cleveland and such. Now, when we're looking at them top end, let's just say everyone's healthy, everyone's productive, as they kind of are now. Obviously, Kyle Lowry's playing what some would argue the best basketball of any point guard in the league. I've had some people argue that he's the best point guard. DeMar DeRozan, for his long-range faults, is a great slasher and a 20-point score. And Valanciunas has been putting more buckets in the basket. Now, this seems like, you know, you have your one, two, and three score. You have Terrence Ross, Lou Williams off the bench. You have guys up front. Uh, Amir Johnson can sometimes have his 15 to 20 point games. Uh, Patterson has some good offensive play. And they got some defense in James Johnson. Uh, they have some other Rivas Vasquez. This should be a better team. Or is there something you think that's missing? Because when I look at this roster, I think the top end is lacking. But other teams like Atlanta, I can make the same argument, and it's not a problem. Yeah, I, I think Atlanta's a bit of an exception with how well Jeff Teague's been playing. They have two all-stars. People forgot how good Al Horford is. He's one of the best big men in the game, which has a massive impact on your team. With Toronto, uh, honestly, while the top end, you could argue that it's lacking, it, they count on young players for too much. Like Jonas Valanciunas, he's got conditioning issues. He can't play a lot of the games, and he's not a great defensive player. If they had a solid uh, defensive center that could back up, limit his minutes, you'd get more quality possessions out of Jonas, and you wouldn't have as big of a drop-off as the game goes on when he starts fading. Uh, same can be said for Terrence Ross. He's a one-dimensional player, basically. He's a shooter, not necessarily a great defender, can't put the ball on the floor. Uh, they need either somebody to start over top of him, and I don't mean Grievous Vasquez, who basically has all the same problems as Terrence Ross, but they need either an established starter or a veteran wing that can provide defense, can provide that clutch scoring, and can step in there when Terrence Ross isn't playing well. That makes sense, and I'm guessing that uh, Lucas Nogueira is not your answer uh, behind JV. Maybe they need someone a little <laughs> bit more established. Now, I I think you're completely right there. Um, I think with JV, it's a two-part issue. I think, number one, I don't think they feed him the ball enough. I think when they do feed him the ball, he's had uh, added aggression, and I think he can score a little bit more, and I think that balanced scoring, when it 
doesn't necessarily have to come from that backcourt would help them. The conditioning mm -hmm. is a factor, of course. You have to be on the floor and stay out of foul trouble, which has plagued him his entire career, to be able to be effective that way. But let's just do what we do best. L let's look at this team, and if there was, let's just say you could, th you could trade anyone. And I guess you can, because it is a business. Now, yeah. I'm going to start this, and, I, and I'm going to say something a little bit unpopular, but I've been talking a couple circles, and it depends how you talk about it, right? Anytime you're in business, you want to sell high and buy low, right? Right. Kyle Lowry, at this age, this contract, just made a starter of the East in the All-Stars. Is there a better opportunity to sell high? Now, I've heard you can't do that to the chemistry. You can't do that to a team who hasn't had sustained success since 2001. Mm -hmm. But would you be able to potentially package him with an Amir Johnson or a, or a passion to, uh, to get one of these players and make kind of a rotational change in that starting five to have the talent maybe better distributed or any of those keywords you want to use. Do you think there's anything to do with that or is there a better move that you can think of? Well, what I'll say is this. While that is possible, um, what they're trying to do right now is the develop an identity as a team. And even though you might be able to sell high on a Kyle Lowry or DeMar DeRozan, DeMar DeRozan could be the first drafted player from the franchise that sticks there all the way through, that makes all-star teams, that has that kind of impact, is connected to the community. Kyle Lowry is the first big name free agent that decided to stay. So while you could sell high on a Kyle Lowry, you're not going to be getting a young star in return because Kyle Lowry is 28 years old. So you're getting a guy like a Rudy Gay, let's say, that's older, kind of has some star potential, but he has warts. I don't think that's the ideal move for this franchise. Now, guys I would consider moving, even though it might disrupt the chemistry, is a guy like Amir Johnson, final year of his uh, his contract, injury concerns, um, grievous are, are you yeah, going to get enough back if you're only moving a guy like Amir Johnson? I mean, like I think the, uh, the idea of moving a, a Lowry or DeRozan would be to bring back that impact mm -hmm. player. Or do you think oh. it's, it's not the impact player that's mattering, it's more the supporting role? Um, it's, it's a bit of both, but like I was going to say with Amir Johnson, I think you would also package him with a Terrence Ross, um, who, I mean, you have uh, Bruno Caboclo, who's developing, you have James Johnson, you have other guys like that that are going to be stepping up into those roles. So if you can package a guy like Terrence Ross, which, I mean, look at a similar player in Dion Waiters that got traded. You got back an Iman Shumpert, a J.R. Smith, and a first-round pick. So if you package Terrence Ross with Amir Johnson, you might get a good collection like that where you're getting draft picks for flexibility. You're getting other guys that are more able to contribute now. Uh, another guy I look at is Grievous Vasquez because him and Lou Williams, they seem a little redundant together. Vasquez isn't a good defender, not a confident shooter. Well, he's a confident shooter. He's just not a good one. Um, so that might be a guy I'd be looking to move as well. I think that's interesting. I think Terrence Ross, I actually completely agree with you. I look at his game, and I think he's lacking a bit of that edge. I think he has the talents and the size to be a, a decent defender and a good shooter. But as long mm -hmm. as DeMar DeRozan's there, I feel he's never going to take that role. Um, ha would he have the six man to his own without Lou Williams, without Vasquez? Maybe something else. But I think for him to flourish, and I think other GMs are going to know this, so I think that does make sense. Amir Johnson or Patrick Patterson. It, it depends on the need of the team yeah. uh, uh, with a Terrence Ross. But do you think that going forward then that DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry, I know they're both talented, but as a fit together, because to mm -hmm. me, some of their skills are a little redundant. Do you think uh, that those two long term are the good pairing? I I think that was more of my argument that would you move a Kyle Lowry for a more you know three point oriented point guard, or would you move a Demar Derozan for a for a, for a shooting guard who tends to spread the floor more when Kyle Lowry drives? You know, a, a, mm -hmm. some argument that way, just based on flow of offense. Well, you know what I think. Kyle Lowry is fantastic as he is, and he has been the best player the past two years. He's a bit of a stopgap. He's going at the end of his contract. He's going to be 32. 
I don't think anyone expects the Raptors to win a title in the next four years, but he's going to be handing the torch over to a DeMar DeRozan. What I'd ideally like to see is getting a point guard that can inherit that position um, and take over once Lowry's older, Jonas is in his prime because Jonas is a few years away from his prime. Uh, DeRozan, you can hand the torch over to him. Like if Let's say we were looking at trade scenarios there, or if we're looking at a trade scenario, you might want to target a guy like Tyler Ennis down in Phoenix. If you can trade a, a Ross, a Mir Johnson, maybe even a Grievous Vasquez if they want a more established point guard for, let's say, the Morris Twins and Tyler Ennis, or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they don't want to part with them, but if you can get someone like that, then you have your long-term solution as as uh, along with Kyle Lowry, who's going to help you get that playoff experience and develop your young talent now. I suppose that's where we view talent acquisition on a different level, which is great because that's how you you have to uh, see it from many vantage points. But to me, when I hear you don't expect to win in the next four years and he's a stopgap till you pass him over, my initial mm -hmm. reaction is, well, why don't you sell him when he's worth something? Right. Like. Right. Like now, because when he's 32, how much are you gonna get? Are you gonna get for him? There is arguably no one better. I mean, I know a guy like Kyrie Irving couldn't be had, but you know, with their struggles, could you not have made even a push to, uh, to a contending team? Maybe give up on a younger player who needs a little bit more nurturing, and mm -hmm. give that playoff ready guy. Well, you, you certainly could, but at the same time, I think without Kyle Lowry, this team is in jeopardy of missing the playoffs, or at least they would have been this season. And you see with other young teams that sell their veteran talent and try to just develop the young guys, without winning, without established veterans that help you get to the playoffs, help you compete every night, you develop bad habits, and it takes a long time for that talent to recover from those bad habits. The playoff experience they're going to get now is going to benefit a Jonas Valanciunas. It's going to benefit a Terrence Ross if they do decide to keep him. It's going to benefit DeMar DeRozan. So that's the value. In do you really think they'd be that bad? I mean, if you look at the playoff picture in the, in, in the East, I mean, a team that did take that route in Milwaukee is going to make the playoffs. A team that did almost take that route, like outside of having to sell low, sell low on... <laughs> Josh Smith, I mean, Detroit essentially kind of did that, you know, mm -hmm. just by draft picks and building through the uh, through youth. I mean, and we're seeing other guys who stick to friends, like uh, the two New York teams, or Brooklyn, New York. It's mm -hmm. not working out. I mean, I don't know. I think, you know, like there's not a Jason Kidd for every team to be had, uh, and right. that's a huge joke. Um, but I don't know. I think you could trade him and build. It's tough. It, it's a really tough argument because I can see it very much both ways. Mm -hmm. I, I see it as if you're in a if you're in a vacuum and it was just talent, I would trade them now. But because of the idea of building the continuity, building the brand, building the We the North, and building the place where free agents want to go, I think that is a big plus too. Because yeah, they're that's starting to develop that culture of a place, and I think that is worth taking the potential loss at the end of Lowry's contract, as opposed to taking full value now. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And the free agent part is a big, big part. I mean, Toronto's going to have the all-star game soon. You want to be a destination. You want to appear like a stable franchise. You want to appear like someone that can retain players and build something. Even if it, you end up being the Atlanta Hawks of the, uh, the mid-2000s. Well, the Atlanta Hawks not a bad place to be right now. It's right. I'm saying this. even if you are at that level where you're a fourth seed, out in the second round kind of thing for a few years, you at least build something there. You get some consistency, and then you can take that next step which could either come through the draft or in free agency. Exactly. Well, I think, uh, to your point, I think the chance of a guy like Ross being sold with some of those expiring contracts, such as Chuck Hayes, Landry Fields, or maybe one of the top boards, is a much more likely thing. And who knows, maybe if Grievous Vasquez is truthful about his predictions, maybe we'll be looking at Kevin Durant on the wing in Toronto, which I know there's zero chance, but at the same point, this is why we play the game, right? <laughs> Although yeah. he would be in the way of my man Bruno, so it'd be tough for me to justify bringing in the MVP versus the uh, Brazilian Kevin Durant, who's two years from being two years. Anyways, Jess, I want to thank you again for another 
fun uh, fun bit here on Phil and the Trademan covering the Toronto Raptors and what maybe could be done, maybe couldn't be done. But anyways, uh, we'll leave it up to you guys to decide and continue the conversation. Please like, share, and everything, and visit hoopslounge.com for more upcoming. And uh, we'll put our Twitter handles at the bottom. Uh, definitely give us both a follow. Uh, Justin's a real funny guy, so you're going to want to give that one a go. For myself and Justin, keep it in the lounge.